Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me tonight. As always, I'm pretty excited about tonight's conversation and tonight's guest. Tonight is a great opportunity for all of us to get to know a little bit more about one of the candidates for Oklahoma County Commissioner. If you're new to these weekly conversations, welcome to the family. We're excited that you found your way here. If you've missed any of these previous conversations, it's okay. You can find them on my YouTube channel. Just jump over to YouTube and look up Conversations with Cubit. You'll find everything there. Be sure to subscribe when you get there and then you can browse all the conversations you want. Uh, but right now, we are streaming live. So I need you to do me a really big favor and share this conversation. That's right. Don't keep this conversation to yourself. We want as many people as possible to be involved in the process and we want them to join in this conversation live. So you absolutely must share this conversation with your community. Hit the share button or start a watch party, whatever you gotta do. Special thanks, as always, goes out to my friends at Green Pasture Studios for hosting these weekly conversations. My friends Richard and Amy James are running things out in Spencer, Oklahoma at their studio and I love everything they're doing out there. Everything from full-fledged movie production, commercials, and even a training academy. I spent a few hours with them last month and it was incredible to watch the movie production process happening right here in Oklahoma City. Look them up, you'd be glad you did. But as you can see, we are not in the fancy studio tonight, but we'll talk much more about that in just a few seconds. First, I want to let you in on what my three simple goals are for having these weekly conversations. One, I simply just wanna add value to my community. Two, I wanna inspire you to believe in what people and communities can become when we're willing to work together. And three, last but not least, just love people, period. No strings attached. All this means is I want you to be inspired. I want you to get useful information and resources, and I wanna celebrate individuals, groups, and organizations who are making a positive impact on our community. Every conversation here on Conversations with Cubit will be about information, inspiration, and hope. Now, anyone who has paid attention to the news in the last couple of years has heard all about the amazing things Ebenezer Baptist Church has done and is doing in our community. One of those things has been a very consistent presence in the Northeast community with food, with household furnishings, and clothing. All, all of this stuff would create a storage and logistic nightmare for most of us, I can tell you. However, my friend Reverend Derek Scobie and his church has partnered with great places and great people. And tonight we are broadcasting from the warehouse in the center of all the logistics and all of the fantastic community outreach. So all this stuff you see is Ebenezer outreach stuff. Uh, we are lucky enough to get the lady who happens to be the hands and the feet of this operation with us tonight. So let's get started. My guest tonight is none other than Pastor Christine Bird. Uh, she's from the New Life Baptist Church in Oklahoma City, and Christine Bird has, has been an active member in pol political policy and public policy and grassroots networking for over 25 years. She served as a political director for the Oklahoma Democratic Party, as well as a deputy field organizer on both of President Obama's election campaigns. She has been recognized nationally by the Democratic National Committee for her efforts. Christine Bird has worked on national and internal party elections, the school board, county and state levels to ensure diversity in political leadership. Her professional background includes public education, mortgages, nonprofit work with the homeless and battered women. And Christine Bird is a member of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority and numerous other local and national organization. Christine Bird not only pastors a church and partners with Ebenezer, she has decided to run for Oklahoma County Commissioner District 1. I met her many years ago while helping with a few community events in the North Highlands community in the North Highlands neighborhood. And she is an extremely loving mother and grandmother. You only need to be around her for about 60 seconds to recognize how much she loves people and how much she loves to serve people. We're connected that way. Uh, but tonight, we want to get to know more about her as a candidate and her goals for the office she seeks. So ladies and gentlemen, give it up, round of applause, make a lot of noise, I guess, for my friend, <laughs> Christine Bird. Thank you. Welcome to Conversations with Cuba. Thank Cubit. you so very much, Cuba. I am excited about being here tonight. Um, you know, uh, 
some exciting I, I said to my children I'm a little bit nervous too you know uh, uh, they say oh mama you'll be fine but you know and then on top of that I'm celebrating my birthday today happy birthday <laughs> to you don't get so, me to sing it oh okay now, now, yeah but but yeah you, I'm not gonna tell my age you're not gonna I was not gonna ask uh, well I, I was not gonna ask <laughs> I was gonna say what are you about 22 23 yeah you, you're pretty close I'm pretty close <laughs> You're getting close, you yeah, know, but yeah. you're doing good. I'm always going to guess around there. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, I've you're been doing good then. <laughs> yeah, been you're real, doing real. good then. So listen, we're going to get to know you a little bit. And okay. so what I've been doing mm -hmm. with uh, my guests is I've been asking them some rapid fire questions. Okay. And, and just to kind of get, uh, I, personally, as a police officer, mm -hmm. this is all I need to know. Once, once you answer these questions uh -uh. right here, I know <laughs> all I need to know, know about, about you. Uh oh. Right? Okay. So, all right. So maybe they're like me, but uh, so you just, all you have to do is just quickly answer one or the other. You just, it's pretty easy. Okay. All right. All right. right. And we'll start off pretty easy. Okay. All right. In Oklahoma, would you rather be in Oklahoma in August or in January? August. August. <laughs> <laughs> do you call it sneakers or tennis shoes? Tennis shoes. Tennis shoes. Would you rather have a phone call or a text message? Phone call. <laughs> phone call, okay. Frontier City or Whitewater? Neither. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't going to neither one of them. All right, all right, all right. Uh, Michael Jackson or Prince? Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson. Is it soda or is it pop? Pop. It's pop. <laughs> <laughs> would, you, what, would you gonna do a truck or would you rather have a car? A car. You're a car person. Are you a handshake or a hug person? A hug. You're a hug person. I love okay. to hug people. All right. Watching, watching TV, is it going to be a scary movie or a comedy? Comedy. 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 Okay. Would you rather go to a birthday party or a wedding? Birthday party. Birthday party. Okay. I'm starting to see the party animal in you. <laughs> Since yeah. the day is your birthday. That's All right. right. All right. Uh, what was worse as a kid for you? Was it the whooping or the punishment? The punishment. The punishment. Yes. They lasted too long. I, yeah. <laughs> just get it over with. I just want her to go ahead and whoop me. Okay. Whoop right. me, please. Get it Stop over talking. With. All right. <laughs> if you're home alone, mm -hmm. we're most likely to find you singing or dancing. Both. <laughs> singing and dancing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Love that. Okay. Okay. Is in Oklahoma City. There's a stretch of road. Some of us call it uh, 235 and some of us call it Broadway Extension. What do you call it? Broadway extension. Broadway extension. Uh, and, and you like comedy. Uh -huh. Would you rather have Eddie Murphy or Kevin Hart? Eddie Murphy. Eddie Murphy. All right. Home cooked meal or go out to eat? Home cooked. You, I know everything I need to know about you. <laughs> what? Shut the show down now. The, oh, I got that, it all. I'm a country girl. <laughs> <laughs> Old school country yeah, girl. Yes, that yes. don't like whoopings. Don't like whoopings. Right, Didn't right. like whoopings. <laughs> I did not well, like you rather, Would you rather have the whooping than the well, I'd rather have the whooping than have whooping. the discussion. And the lecture. And all yeah, and the lecture. Just whoop me and get it over Do you with. lecture your kids? Yes, I have become my mother. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my kids are all grown. Uh -huh. So uh, my, my grandchildren. Don't make, that, grown don't make them lecture proof. Well, they get lectures. They get lectures, okay. you know. And it's like, and they still say, please, mama, please just get it over just with. Just get it over with. Now, the grandkids call me Nana. And they get whoopings. Yeah. And I do like my mother. I tell them to go outside and find a switch. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and, you know, so they come in here with that the little, little, bitty thing. little thing, thing you know. Here, yeah. Nana. So well, my, uh -huh. my, my grandkids don't they don't they don't get any corporal punishment. Ain't that a shame? I don't do it. We ain't going to do it. That's good. I ain't going to allow it. God bless you. Allow, not around me. But their parents better. But anyway. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so listen. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself before we start talking about the campaign. Where yes. are you from? Where you grew up? Where you go to school? I am originally uh, from Pine Bluff, Arkansas, uh, by way of a smaller town called Wabi Siki. And uh, so say that Wabi Siki. And Wabi Siki, the downtown was probably uh, four stores. You could zoom through it, and if you blink, you, you missed, missed it. it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And so I came from Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Um, my mother uh, raised us. I have nine brothers and sisters. There are Big nine family. of us. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother put us all through college and stuff. And my mother and my grandmother and my grandfather uh, 
did not know a father figure, so I'm being honest, didn't know. But my grandmother and mother were very strong black women. Um, even though when we were brought up, my mother and my uh, grandmother saw them, we saw them go clean houses. Mm -hmm. And that was the one thing they, you know, talked about with us. They never wanted to see us, any of their children, uh, doing that type of labor, that type of work. And so they impressed upon us education, yeah. education. So, yeah. And my grandmother was a sharecropper and my, my grandfather, they were sharecroppers. So, and you came of age in Arkansas when you could go pick cotton. Oh, man. And you did that? Yeah, but wanted to because that meant I was just that right over to be grown, uh -huh. you know, so it was exciting when you say get up at four o'clock and go jump on the truck, you know, and. Uh, when did you come to Oklahoma City? <sighs> if I tell you that, then I'm going to tell my age. Oh, well, OK. OK. Well, well I, no, I won't. I, I will say that I've been here in Oklahoma City about 35 years. Mm -hmm. I came to Oklahoma City uh, out of college. Uh, I'm going to say this, and young women will understand this, following behind a man, okay. <laughs> I came to Oklahoma City. <laughs> uh -huh. Came to Oklahoma City and um, thought I was madly in love uh -huh. and decided to leave Arkansas and um, came here. And, um, you know, uh, one thing about Arkansas, uh, Arkansas still, at, during that time when I came, um, there was still a uh, atmosphere of um, racism. It's mm -hmm. a different, a lot of people not understand, will not understand this, but the racism in Arkansas is different than the racism here in Oklahoma. Mm. In Arkansas, it was in your face. Yeah. You know, we knew what the Klan was. They would have parades in the downtown area. Yeah. So we knew that. We knew what it was, you know, uh, to see a sea of black women at the bus stop in white uniform to go clean and raise uh, other people's children. So it was a difference. So um, my mother said to me once, uh, she said to me when I made the decision that um, I needed to leave Arkansas, mm -hmm. she said, because uh, your mindset is beyond Arkansas and you're going to either get in trouble, yeah. you're going to get in jail, or I'm gonna beat you half to death because <laughs> you got in trouble and you got in jail. So I don't, you know, I don't want to say my mother was an abuser. She was not. But mm -hmm. one of the things was that she just said, uh, "Your thoughts are out of the box." Yeah. And so you need to go and you need to find that dream that you're looking for because it's not here in Arkansas. Right. Right. So I came to Arkansas. So part of it was, you know, like I say, falling behind someone. But the other part was that uh, I wanted more. Right. I wanted more. Right. Where'd you go to college? I went to University of Arkansas, Pine Bluff. Uh -huh. It was uh, called, it was A-M-N-E-N College. And then when they merged with the university system, it became the University of Arkansas, Pine Bluff. I did my undergraduate work there. I came here to Oklahoma City and immediately, I won't say immediately, but uh, I did my master's program. I did a master's in urban education. I did a master's in multicultural education at Langston University. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, then I uh, wasn't enough for me, so I started my study um, to begin to uh, work on my doctorate. Mm -hmm. And so I at uh, Grand Canyon University, and I hope to defend my paper uh, uh, this fall. Oh man. Well, power to you on all <laughs> that schooling. I, uh, I admire it, and I'm, I and I appreciate it for sure. Tell me about. Yeah, uh, a little bit about this place and your partnership with Ebenezer and and because my team, we work with you. Or I say we, they work with you because <laughs> yeah. you see them a whole lot more than you see me. But but it's a, it's a, it's a marvel of what happens in the logistics and all the stuff and keeping up where things are and who's getting what and how it's serving. You well, know, let, do a great job. Well, let me say this: the first the the vision for this came through uh, Pastor Derek Scobie. Mm -hmm. uh, this started out, we didn't, he didn't start out with this vision of the furniture and the clothing and the household item. He started out with food box food. giveaway mm -hmm. and many times some of the officers would come over and help. 
uh, because it was a major thing. We might get two or three trucks within a week. Mm -hmm. and, and long, long lines. Long lines. Yeah. And, uh, and so we were giving out the food boxes. Um, I got uh, connected with uh, Pastor Scobie on the food boxes, going back to what I want to connect something, going back to what my mother said. My mother said, your thoughts are beyond what we're thinking. Mm -hmm. That's how I got connected with Pastor Scobie, uh, uh, talking, uh, was getting food boxes for my church. And um, one of the things was that uh, hmm, being a woman pastor, it's not easy sometimes. Yeah. You know, uh, everybody's not on that bandwagon. Right. And so I was receiving uh, food boxes and it wasn't, it went okay, but it wasn't going as well as it should. And uh, 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 Pastor Reed had mentioned that um, uh, Pastor Scobie and told me to visit with him. And so that's what I did. Yeah. And the rest has, is, history. is history. So we start doing the food boxes and uh, then um, we started, he worked with an organization called World Vision mm -hmm. International, uh, which is based all here in the United States, but they do work all overseas and everywhere. And they had talked to Pastor Scobie about how do you, how can we help you help the community? Yeah. And so, um, and they talked about the furniture and the household items with the understanding that these items were going to go to families that were in need. They're going to go to nonprofits and churches and they were going to go to schools. And, uh, and so, um, we started out thinking this is going to be a small venture. This is mm -hmm. going to be small. You know, well, let me say this. I started out. Yeah. I started thinking this is going to be small and we'll do this for a little while and we'll move on and yeah. it'll be something else. So we're going into our, this is our, we've ended our second year, yeah. going into our third year, yeah. this little small thing that I thought and was going to. you to really love it. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Because what it does if you are truly giving to people and you're giving from your heart and you're giving because you uh, feel the need and know the need is there, not only are you helping them, those people, but you're growing in the process. You cannot see the hunger, you cannot see the need and not be touched by it. Because one of the things you find out, you find out about yourself. Mm -hmm you find out about your in level of endurance, your level of giving. So when folks come in and when folks go to the line and you, you all have worked the lines for, and they've been down at Russell Perry's building, mm. and we give until we don't have anything left. But it brings us such joy because that one person in line may say thank you, that one person may give you a story or a testimony, yeah. what you did for them. Sometimes we, we've helped schools and we've been able to do giveaways for people in education. We gave a giveaway for those that are, uh, help people in the medical field, the, um, the doctors and nurses, you know, and that was, when you talk about touch my heart and they were in line and they kept saying, you all thought about us. Mm -hmm. And so being, we did, and so we give the furniture, we give the household items, we give kayak boats, <laughs> uh, we give uh, lawnmowers. We, we've got, we always get stuff and we never give them a list to say, we want this, we want this. We whatever we found out, whatever we have on the truck, there's, there's God already somewhere. has somebody in mind there's for a need it. Somewhere. So well, I remember when we first got the first three kayak boats and we all laughed because we like kayak, who needs kayak boats? But then so happened through a program that you all do mm -hmm. for youth. Found, found, a youth, found a use for it. Yes, found a uh, use for it. And so we felt such joy. Mm -hmm. uh, we've gotten uh, water. <laughs> And I laugh and everybody teases me about the water that we get. And, uh, and so I thought, oh, what are we going to do with all this water? But we found a use for it. We found we get Legos, but we're able to help some of the schools that have STEM research programs. Mm -hmm. So it is a way to be able to be a blessing. And I think 
God for Pastor Scobie having the vision and taking hold of it. And then I thank World Vision and Q and, and Reed for uh, choosing Ebenezer as a hub to be able to do this. Then I thank Pastor Scobie for letting me tag alone. Yeah, yeah. I, I tag alone. He lets me tag alone and be in here in the work in the warehouse to kind of help organize who gets what and who needs what. And so it's, and you do a great job. You do thank a great you job. very we, much. We, 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 our officers hear a story or see a need and they immediately call you. They get they you on speed dial to find out if there's something that fits the need here or if it's coming in. And they'll wait around weeks and they'll come sometimes in their personal vehicles to deliver they it. They do. They make sure they get it, get it to where it needs to be. So I'm really proud of them and I'm, I'm happy to get to work with you. Tell me about your campaign and the platform. What, what, why, why, why are you getting into this, <laughs> this political stuff? Well, I, I, you know, uh, I've always been in political, always right. been involved with politics because, you know, uh, people always think uh, politics is about the presidential in the White House, but politics is local first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so um, to this, for me to jump into the county commissioner's race, it was a given because when I looked at what the county commissioners do and some of their duties, I could not help but being drawn to that race. Uh, and it was not, a, and I'm not running as a referendum on the county jail. Mm -hmm. See, everybody said, are you running because the county jail? That's one of the issues. But there are so many other duties and responsibility of the county commissioner. And most people don't realize the county commissioner with the pharmacy and with uh, they regulate and help look over the federal food stamp program. And then they also uh, do burials. Uh, they, you know, they have temporary housing. Uh, you know, yes, they do the roads and the bridges, but I think people have such a narrow view because the county, the county jail has been the focus right mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Yes, I, I will be honest. Yes, I'm running for that, you know, for that Christina and for that uh, Dustin and for that Charles Moore and for that Gabriel and all those people that have died in the county jail. Yes, I'm running for them because they're the children and the fathers and the mothers of somebody and somebody wants an answer. So yes, part of that is for them, but it is about bringing our county to another level. And when you talk about uh, the different cities within Oklahoma County from Jones, because the needs of Jones, Oklahoma are different than the needs of mm. Spencer, Oklahoma, or Forest Park, or the village. So the needs are different. And so how do we be inclusive and bring all those entities into the circle and make sure that they know that they are important and that we are paying attention to the needs of their individual community? That's part of the reason. Then I want transparency. Mm. I want transparency. Yeah. I want us to have county commissioners that are available and not available during election cycles, available. <laughs> right. That I can call them and they'll answer. They're available in Spencer, Oklahoma, and they're looking at the holes, the mud holes in Spencer, Oklahoma. Are they available in Jones and economic development is a big issue. So I'm running because we can do better. Right. We can do better. And I feel that I am equipped. And for me, God has equipped me for such a time as this. Mm -hmm. So right. I'm running because it's my calling. Right. And people need someone that is a leader that's willing to serve. And to serve me, you got to get muddy. And you got to put your hands to the plow and you got to be willing to do the work. Right. So check, so, so t I'm gonna take you back a little bit. Okay. So during the, during the last couple of years, uh, it's been, we've had some serious issues. We've had, uh, and leaders couldn't predict these issues. I mean, no. there's no way you could have predicted no. a pandemic. You couldn't, uh, predicted the social justice movement that yeah. we had in 2020 with, with uh, George Floyd. Uh, and even here, we've had uh, the Julius Jones issue mm -hmm. and protest. Can you, can you speak to me about how you would handle, uh, or how you feel like we handled them at the time and how you would handle such things uh, should they arise? Because there's always some unknowns that come up in leadership. 
Let me speak to the Julius Jones issue yeah, first. Yeah. First of all, let me be transparent. I know Julius personally. Mm -hmm. Julius grew up with my boys. He went to John Marshall and played basketball with my son, Michael. Mm -hmm. So I know him. He sat at my table and he ate lasagna. And so he played basketball in, the, in front of my house. And how would I have handled it a little bit different? First of all, for me, I believe, and I know in my heart, he was innocent mm -hmm. because I know him. Did he make some wrong choices? And as my mother would say, watch the company you keep. Mm -hmm. He did. I think as far as with the Julius Jones, I think at that time we did what was needed to be done. I know every, you know, the county commissioner cannot make any uh, decision about the Julius Jones. Right, obviously. We can have our input, uh, they can have their input and think what they personally think. But there are certain things they have to, they have no jurisdiction over. And the uh, county commissioner, legislators have no jurisdiction in those areas. But I think that people wanted to see where our leaders stand with yeah. those issues. Mm -hmm. They wanted to know, do you stand with us as we're walking the pavement, as we are asking the DA and we're asking the governor, where do you stand with us? Will you come out there on the front line and march with us? Or are you going to stay in the background and whisper your support? Because you're more worried about how people will react when election cycle comes. So I think people wanted county wanted our elected leaders to know where do you stand with the Julius Jones? Not that you could fight or you could let him out, but where did you stand? Yeah. As far as the pandemic, I think I think overall we did uh, a good job. I think we did. Um, I think uh, one of the things is that making sure people were getting the vaccines and, and making sure that we were speaking to the communities that were running low or not uh, aggressively going out to get the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And you yourself know that in the African-American community, there were some uh, people pushing back, saying, well, because of the Tuskegee and different things. But I think part of it is not even knowing what the Tuskegee research was truly about. So they just, you know, tick tock and, you know, mm -hmm spread yeah. a lot of misgiving. How did we, how did you, what was, what's your assessment on how we doing or what we did with the, with the COVID relief money that came into the county? I know that it went to individuals to help with rent and utility bills. And I, uh, I thank the county commissioners for making that step. Uh, and I think it was truly needed. I think more money should have went to small businesses because there are still small businesses feeling the effect of the COVID and mm -hmm. having to shut down, you know, because of COVID. So I wish and I hope, I know they have another 168 million that they have to spend. And I hope they direct that some of that to small businesses and it does not go, and this is my own opinion, it does not go to build the new jail. I want them to give that to small businesses, you know, and help them stay open to keep jobs going. Yes, and I think more effort needs to put toward rents and utility because people are still hurting. People are still hurting. And so I think that money needs to go for what the government designated it for as far as small businesses and individual families that have needs because there's still a lot of hurt. We still get calls of individual asking for food boxes, mm -hmm. you know, uh, people asking for, you know, utility bills because they can't pay their rent and landlords, you know, and landlords are feeling the effect also because the money is not getting to landlords as quickly as it is. It should. And landlords are frustrated. They don't want to have to put people out. Right. But then what are they supposed to do? And so I want that money to go to individuals, landlords and small what do, businesses. Where, where do you stand? Because we hear, and especially this week on, on TV and in the news, I, mean, I think they voted about building a new jail. <clears throat> Where do you stand on that? Because I hear some people say, uh, we don't need a 1,400-bed facility. We're making the jail bigger. If the bigger you make it, the faster they're going to fill it up. Uh, that's one side of it. The other side says, <clears throat> we need a more humane place to stay. 
and we want to take, not only do we want to build another jail, but we need to do some other things before we need to, to build a jail, like mental health and put money into and other things. Where do you, where, where is the, where it is, are you on this issue? I do believe that uh, we need to build another jail. Uh, for me, the jail was inadequate from the offset. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that they put the thought they needed to when they built that jail. I think that uh, because I've talked to individuals that have been in jail, received phone calls, and they talk about the bed bugs, they talk about the roaches, they talk about the sewage bag up, they talk about some of the things that are taking place in the jail. One, I do believe we need to new, build a new jail, but I do not believe that we need to use COVID money to build a new jail. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with that. Yeah. Two, I think that what we need to do is there should be a separate separate units for those that are mentally ill because when you put mentally ill let me go back to something the county jail is understaffed everyone that works at the <clears throat> county is not necessarily equipped to work at the county i've heard horror stories from people talking about the mistreatment now, what I'm saying is, I'm not saying that people should not be in jail because if people committed crimes, they need to own, pay their price to society. But I think there's a level of humanity. Mm -hmm. When animals in the animal shelter are better housed than inmates, I have a problem. I have a problem. So building a jail it's not just what we need. We need to be able to hire folks and train folks and have them an understanding of who and what they are doing at work. It's mm -hmm. not just a job. Right. Okay. Then two, I think that we need to talk about the humanity of it. Yes, they need to pay their debt to society, but also you want to treat them in a dignified way. I know somebody saying, dignified? They broke into my house. Dignified, I'll give them dignity. No, what I'm saying is, I'm saying is when we house them and they're in jail, do we have to treat them as if they are prisoners of war? Mm -hmm. Do we not have some love and respect? So we have to house mentally ill separate and we have to and mentally ill need to have staffing making sure that if they're on medicine that someone is monitoring that they're taking their medicine that you have medical people on staff within that mental health facility. Mm -hmm. Three, homeless should not be in jail. Having lived on the streets myself for two years and when I hear stories about somebody's in jail because they don't have anywhere to go, am I, am I to be treated like that because I don't have a home? Right. I believe one of the things I know that Oklahoma City has a homeless plan. And I believe that Oklahoma County and Oklahoma City need to look at that plan and see how they can collaborate together to make their effort more powerful because we serve the homeless. I serve the homeless with Pastor Scobie in Ebenezer Baptist Church. He has his hand mm -hmm. every Saturday morning at six o'clock. More women and children are on this are coming on the streets. Younger people are coming on the street. They need housing. They need affordable housing. Oh, we need shelters that basically they don't have to leave at six o'clock in the morning and take all their possessions with them and then can't get back into the shelter until five o'clock in the evening. So mentally ill, we need a unit. Homeless, we need to up our housing, uh, our shelter facility and our programs for the homeless and understand that homelessness is not a choice. I didn't choose to be homeless. It says that we all are two paychecks away from being homeless. We all are. Lose two paychecks and you're scraping, trying to figure out how to rob Peter to pay Paul. 
Then three, I don't think people that have tickets need to be in the county jail. Mm. No, traffic tickets. <clears throat> when you put, people become their environment. Yeah. And when you put people that are mentally ill, people that have tickets, people that maybe had a bad night, and then you put them in a jail with someone that has committed violent crimes. All right, looks like we had some, we just uh, crashed. <laughs> it just happens. We're in a warehouse, in an <laughs> undisclosed location. So Wi-Fi crashed on us. But just before we, we, we crashed, mm -hmm. before we got noticed that we crashed, I was about to ask you about the occupancy of the county jail. I think it was built for 1,200. Mm -hmm. And I think I heard that the new jail, the proposal for it is increased to 1,400. What are you about the occupancy level, especially when we're talking about criminal justice reform, Oklahoma being the 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 lock them up capital of the world? Yeah. You know, and we're trying to reduce we're trying to reduce our, our inmate population. How do you feel about that? I, I have some problem with that, you know, with the fourteen hundred, because to me, that's not criminal justice reform. Okay. Um, that that tells me, you know, in one breath, you're saying we're talking about criminal justice reform, but how can you talk about criminal justice reform when you're talking about increasing the amount of individuals in, you incarcerate? Criminal justice means that you, I'm talking about a design again to bring out the mentally ill, bring out the homeless, bring out those folks with tickets. And so my thing is our numbers should be lower instead of higher. You, you know, because you're telling me that well, we, we, need more well, we haven't been we haven't been at twelve hundred. I don't think ever. I think it was built for twelve hundred, but we've never been uh, really at twelve hundred. I think it probably is is hovering around on a consistent basis at about fourteen hundred. And you're saying you think we can get lower. I think we can get lower. Yeah, yeah. I think we can get lower, but I think it is going to take work on our parts. When you talk about criminal justice reform, you're talking about a redesign and a restructuring and how we do our criminal justice arena. Mm -hmm. That you're not going to continue this to uh, incarcerate nonviolent offenders. Maybe they need a program. Uh, you maybe have some that need drug. Uh, again, and I forgot drug drugs, yeah, uh, drug, drug court, programs, yeah. and you know, you mentioned earlier about drug court. So we need programs for people that have problems with drug and alcohol addiction. Uh, putting them in the county jail does not help that addiction. All it does is you holding them and keeping them, and I don't know if we're keeping them from the drugs anyway, because <laughs> after I saw the, the inmates on TV with a barbecue, I'm like, if they can do a barbecue grill in the county jail, what else are they doing in there? So I, I think that when we start talking about criminal justice reform, and that is one of my top priority, we have to take a hard look at who we're incarcerating and why we are incarcerating and also work with other community groups. We're, to me, it's like we're saying that we're in this by ourselves. What's the, well, I got, this is a good question for you. What's the role of the church in the reduction of inmates at the county jail? How can, how can the church assist the county? The church can assist the county in that the church uh, ministers, witness, and help individuals that have drug and alcohol problems and folks that are going through tough times. The church should be a spiritual hospital. Mm. Now, some folks are not going to like what I'm going to say, but the church cannot be fearful of individuals that may have problems, whether it's drug and alcohol, whether it's homelessness, you know, uh, mental health problems. It says such were some of you. Mm. And when we start looking at the foundation and who is in the church, there's nobody in the church that's holy or that has been without sin, mm -hmm. as we say. So the church has a role in ministering and being an outlet for people to be able to go to and not being so judgmental. Mm -hmm. We can't be judgmental. If we are to make changes in the criminal justice field in Oklahoma County, 
It is going to take the church community. It is going to take nonprofits. It is going to take uh, programs like the drug court. It is going to take mentoring our youth before they get to that point. It is going to take being open about mental health mm -hmm. rather than that being the little dirty secret nobody talks about. Mm -hmm. But we talk about it. So it takes a holistic approach. So the church can play a role in and that if they have members that are going through bad times, rather than be someone that they can lean on, the church has a role and it needs to step up and accept this role and not fear and shine away from it. One more question, because you've, you've really done a good job of telling me what your priorities were and are and, and, and how you want to address them or, or identifying the problem that you want mm -hmm. to address. But there's one that everybody is kind of a, it's a hard subject to deal, but how do you deal with the racial disparity in the county jail or in criminal justice system at all? You know, there's the, uh, uh, we, the numbers don't lie. No. But uh, if you're African-American or Hispanic, uh, the likelihood of you being arrested, incarcerated are, are almost double, if mm -hmm. not more than that, than someone that's non, uh, a person of non-color. How do you address it? The first thing you have to admit that there is a problem. And many want to pretend that there's not that disparity. That disparity reflects our society. Mm. And if our society has that disparity, it is in our county jail. Mm. And so we have to deal with it and understand it. Then we have to have hard conversation and truthful conversations about it. People want to pretend like the reason Hispanics and blacks are in there because they're the only ones being bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sometimes when you poor and when you are, uh, you tend to, get highlighted or deal with more things than others. I think that what we have to do is have hard conversations about it. There has to be an aggressive, uh, and I know you all, the county did a hiring thing at Ebenezer. There have to be people that look like people of black and brown yep. skin. Mm -hmm. Because when you tend- Representation. Yes, representation, because when you walk in there and all you see is one race predominantly in control or employed, and they're the ones talking to you. I talked to a young lady Sunday at my church, and she told me something that just made me cry. She said, uh, Pastor, uh, men are not allowed in the hub where we are. And she began to tell me that, and she began to tell me about the number of black women and, and Hispanic women. In the jail. In the jail. Mm -hmm. And she talked to me about uh, an incident where a white officer came in the hub and pulled a young black female out because she had been aggressive or, you know, not, I'm gonna say just like she said, not falling in line. Mm -hmm. And she said the young girl uh, came back and it was almost like, um, I'm trying to think of the movie, but like it, she was in control now. They got, they set her straight. Mm -hmm. We in charge of this. There has to be more representation within the county jail and not just on the uh, officers, but those on leadership, mm -hmm. those as you go up the ladder of leaders, it's got to be more of us speaking. But then, as there are more of us speaking, there has to be, the disparity doesn't just come from the county jail. Hubert, it comes from the street. Mm. So they see more white officers in their neighborhood than they see us. They see, so the disparity just flows into the county jail. The disparity and, and, and the racial disparity and the racialism is in society. Mm. And the jail is only reflecting what's out there. It's reflecting what's out there. So 
it is not just a, a conversation for the jail, the county jail. But you're going to be leading this conversation. If you take office, you're leading the conversation. I'm leading the conversation. <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm telling folks that we can do better. We can, we're going to have some hard conversations. And everybody may not like the conversation, but until folks have hard conversation, truth conversation about what is going on, whether it's a county jail, whether it's about gang violence, whether it's about uh, inmates being raped and brutalized in the jail, and not just talking about men, I'm talking about women. Mm -hmm. Until we have hard conversations about that, and until we make folks accountable, see, we got to stop having fear of saying, we're not gonna hold anybody accountable. Yeah. Somebody needs to answer. You can't tell me that 18 people have died and nobody knows an answer. Somebody has to be accountable. Some mother needs to know what happened to my son. Some husband needs to know, why didn't my wife make it home? Mm. Accountability, transparency, truth, fortitude. And that's what I can offer as the next county commissioner of District 1. There you go. I'm ready for the fight. Tell us how, you, how, tell us how we support you. How do we, how do we get to your, your, your page, your, your campaign? How do we help you? You can, first of all, I can't overlook the church in me. <laughs> first, you gotta pray for me. <laughs> pray for me. Then, if you want to help this campaign, I'm going to give out my cell number. I don't, everybody in the city have my cell number oh, anyway. Be careful about that. Now, you gonna do it? Yeah, gonna I'm gonna do, do it. Okay. I'm gonna do it. Everybody Go right has my cell number. Go right ahead. There's Four, your camera right there. 405-706-0361. That's my number. I'm not afraid to take your calls. Please call me. You can also go to my Facebook page, Christine Bird for County Commissioner. You can also go to my website, Christine Bird for County Commissioner. And you can also stop at my church, 900 North, uh, mm, 220, 233 Northeast 88th, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, in North Highland. Come by there because I'll talk to you after Bible study. Mm, <laughs> right. But I will talk to you. But also, you know, uh, I don't know, and I'm sorry, I don't know my post office box by heart, but if you go to my Facebook page and my uh, website, you can find my post office box. I need volunteers. I need, as a kid say, I need some money. You need, you need the dollars. I need some you dollars because campaigns don't run on air, and no. I, I need to get some cards out there, and I need to do some mailing. So, hey. Uh, for my sorrows out there, Delta Sigma Theta sorority, <laughs> you can send me $19.13. That's the year that we, the greatest sorority, was incorporated. So, 1913. <laughs> now, the rest of y'all don't send me 1913. They can, they can also do 1900. Now, y'all, yeah, come on now. Okay. See, you thinking like I'm thinking. You're you right, think yeah, we, we yeah. on the same 19, page. Nineteen dollars is one thing, but nineteen hundred. See, you thinking right. like okay. I'm thinking. Right. See, see how we, <laughs> we, we, we got this going here. Nineteen hundred. It will help me out. But uh, anything, you know, five, ten dollars, you know, whatever you can do. Uh, go to my Facebook page. Go to my uh, website, Christine Bird for County Commissioner. If you just want to walk with us, uh, we always need people to walk and knock doors because we're talking to people about the needs of Oklahoma County, what the county needs. I can't change it by myself. I can't. I'm not going to give you this song and dance. I'm going to go in there with this big agenda and I'm going to become superwoman and I'm boom. I would be lying. I'm going to tell you with your help, your help, we as a county can change the atmosphere of what's happening in Oklahoma County. We can bring criminal justice reform we can enhance and build small businesses. We can ask for transparency on our budgets and on our bond issue, transparency and truthfulness. We can care about Jones the same way I want to care about the village. I want to care about Spencer, Oklahoma, Midwest City and Dale City and Forest Park. I want to care about Lake Illuminus. I want to care about everybody, but I can't do it without you. So I'm asking you, a leader with a heart to change Oklahoma County. That's Christine Bird. And I'm asking you, June the 28th, write it down, 
Write it down. Well, don't try, don't go on your memory. We're gonna remind the I'm going to remind you. You're going to see me everywhere. You're going to be so sick of me. You say if she put one more fly on my door, <laughs> if she called me, give me one more robocall. But June the 28th, if you want change and transparency and truthfulness and inclusiveness, you want Christine Bird, County Commissioner. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for, for having the courage to serve others because I know uh, firsthand that it takes a lot of courage to sacrifice what you want for other people's needs. And I'd see you do that on a daily basis here and in your church and in the community. And then thank thanks, you. it takes a lot of courage to put your name on the ballot. Thank you for having so, me. I appreciate you being on here. Thank, thank you so you. much. That's it for Conversations with Cubit. We will see you next week. Thank you so much for joining in.